gets larger. So the rich get richer. So in terms of monopoly, if we go back to that, if you have a lot of properties, you'll get more money, which means you can build more properties, which means you'll get more money, which means you can build more properties. So eventually there's a point, because there's this positive feedback loop, where there's no real, no real point in playing any further past that point because you pretty much won. Um, there's nothing that any other player can do to, to stop you winning. So positive feedback loops are bad because they remove some of this dramatic tension. So at some point the game just becomes uh, basically really predictable and there's no sense of playing. Uh, so you want to avoid them for that reason. Uh, negative feedback loops uh, can be frustrating in a different way. So if I'm, say, a really skillful player and I'm playing, say, Mario Kart, and I'm always in the lead, and then uh, people are always hitting me with the blue shells. Okay? Uh, so that's a negative feedback loop. It's pulling me back uh, from being in the lead. It's pulling me back so the, the gap uh, closes. Um, so that's good. that's good for players who aren't very good at the game because it keeps everyone roughly together. There's no clear winner. Uh, but it's, it's, it can be frustrating for skilled players because they, they find that they're not, allowed, they're not able to, uh, to show their skill uh, because they keep getting pulled back. Um, so that, that can remove any desires behind challenge. So if you have a game that's really focused around the challenge or, or competition aesthetics, then uh, negative feedback loops can really uh, hurt your game. Uh, but if, if you manage to balance them properly, they can actually be really good because uh, it keeps uh, casual players interested. Um, so it makes games uh, are able to access a wider audience. So negative feedback loops are good in some ways as long as they're balanced properly and people know going in that it has this negative feedback loop. Okay, and then the last uh, dynamics tool is this psychological profile analysis. So basically you just think of the psychology of, of the players and uh, what, how they play your, how, how you think they'll play your game because that affects the system. It affects the dynamics. If you know that no one's going to bluff, then there's no need to have this bluff dynamic in your game. Um, or maybe you want to make it more obvious that you can bluff so that more people do it. Um, so this is, uh, it's hard to quantify exactly how you do this. It depends on your game and what your audience is and, and uh, how much you want to go into it. But you can get a lot of this information from playtesting. So if you do playtests and see how people play your game, that gives you some sort of information about the psychology behind uh, the choices they're making. All right, and so the last section is mechanics. So there's, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, options you can have for mechanics. Um, every game, whenever you interact with it, you're interacting with mechanics. So some examples here are cards, you have a shuffling mechanic, a drawing mechanic, revealing your cards mechanic, uh, bidding mechanics, and so on. Shooters have things like jumping, shooting, reloading, spawning. Uh, collecting items, uh, uh, capturing a flag, you know, all these things are mechanics. Um, and then a game like golf has things like swinging and hitting the ball, uh, you know, getting out of the rough, uh, putting on the green. These are all mechanics. Things that the players actually do in the game are mechanics. So mechanics plus some content is a, gives you the dynamics. Should be plus players as well, I guess, because you need players to get that in. Um, so content is, is levels and art assets and things. So these are, are things we can control to create dynamics. So mechanics are usually influenced by some programmer, and content is made by some artist or level designer. So yeah, but basically. The mechanics are where we start whenever we want to change the dynamics. So we can tweak, um, tweak the mechanics. So, for example, we can add or remove feedback loops, like here. We can remove some of that positive feedback loop by saying there's a new mechanic that 
maybe if you don't have much money, you get subsidies for building houses or something. Or if you have too much money, maybe you get taxed at 50% instead of 10% when an income tax card comes up. Um, and maybe those taxes are redistributed to the poorest players. So that makes the game uh, a lot better for people who, say, maybe just rolled randomly at the start. Uh, lets them stay in the game longer, makes the game uh, more dramatic and interesting. But uh, these have other problems. So if you ever play Monopoly, try playing with that, and you'll see. Um, and then we have to tweak. So I said 50% before, but I mean, is that a good number? Who knows? We have to basically iterate and play the game, see if 50% is a good number, try again, change it maybe to 25%, if that's too low, maybe increase it to 30%. So this is this uh, doubling and halving values, so it's basically a binary search over the space of, of uh, our variables. And um, that can usually help you find the proper uh, variables. So this is um, what basically Sid Meier does, he said, uh, for civilization and games like that. He just doubles and halves values till he gets to the right ones. Um, and he, he said he notices that a lot of beginning game designers uh, Increase by like ten percent increments, and it takes forever to, to to get good values. So next time you're making a game and the jumping high doesn't seem fun enough, just double it and see how fun that is. Okay. If it's too high, then half the difference. If that's too low, then you know, double the difference. All right. And so yeah, the main thing is here: you just have to play the game and see what happens in the dynamics and how that affects the aesthetics. So, uh, looking at how things interact, basically uh, looking at this one dynamic time pressure. So it's a di dynamic you've probably seen in, in a lot of games. It's used to create a dramatic tension aesthetic. So we want to create some sort of uh, dramatic moments in a game. An easy way to do it is to add this time pressure dynamic. And the way that we add time pressure is we introduce some mechanics, something like a simple time limit or some sort of pace monster chasing you. So that could be like, um, I don't know if you played, I think it's called Igneous. It's a game, independent game that uh, was I think, submitted to the uh, Independent Game Awards. But basically in that, the level's basically being destroyed and you have to outrun the destru destruction of the level. Um, so that's some sort of thing that is chasing you. Usually that's more interesting to the player, even though it has the same effect and creating a time pressure thing. This might be more interesting than some simple time limit, uh, which players may tend to find stale. Uh, another thing is a depleting resource. So that uh, could be something like, uh, while you're in this room, your health gradually depletes or something. or. Um, you know, you've only got so much ammo and you have to kill all these units. Uh, so you have to, to keep your ammo in check. Um, so these all give you some sort of uh, time pressure dynamic, but the way they do it is different and can affect players' perceptions of it. Even though they each, they each uh, create this dramatic tension kind of feeling in the game aesthetic. All right, so in conclusion, uh, changes in aesthetics, we should say, changes in aesthetic goals create completely different dynamic requirements, uh, which in turn means you have to implement different mechanics. Uh, game design is hard because of the two degrees of separation. Um, and this uh, framework makes game design easier, so that's, that's why I think it's good. And um, yeah, formal model is good. And uh, this kind of system helps us analyze what went right or in, in great games so that we can learn from them. And instead of saying that game was fun, I want to make a fun game, we can say they, re they really used uh, their stealth mechanic well. And uh, so maybe you can copy ideas from how they use their stealth mechanic to create this uh, tension aesthetic or whatever. Um, yeah, any questions? No? All right. uh, I've got more slides if you want me to keep going. <laughs>